Hello again. Welcome back to Introducing Persistence. In this lesson, we're going to learn about object serialization in Java. We'll start with a little background, then, continuing with the test first approach, we'll write a test method to test two new methods save my library to serial file and get my library from serial file. Then, we'll write the save method. Java serialization is a built in set of classes that allow us to convert a Java object to a sequence of bytes that could then be saved in a disk file or sent over a network to another computer running Java. Object serialization automatically handles nesting of objects and object references, like our person inside a book inside of my library. When we serialize an object, we use the class object output stream. This class has a write object method that does the work for us. The object is compressed as it is serialized. Once converted, the serialized object can be written to a disk file or sent over the network. When we want to reconstruct an object from a serialized format, we use the object input stream. This class has a method called readObject that reconstructs an object from a serialized format. Like the method in the XStream library, the read object returns a generic object that we then need to cast back to a my library. Now why might we want to use object serialization? One reason is that it is built into Java so we don't need any extra program libraries. Serialization is designed to be very fast and efficient and it compresses objects. This could be important if we had large objects that needed to travel over a slow network. One of the disadvantages of serialization is that the format is not standard or human readable. Only a Java program can read a serialized object. Also, as we'll see, in order to use serialization, we need to make two small changes to our classes. What about XML? XML is a widely used standard and, as we have seen, is easy for a person to read and understand. So an XML file could in theory be used by a wide variety of programs if we wanted another program to have access to our objects. Also, we saw that at least for the Xtreme library, we didn't have to modify our person, book, or my library objects at all. So what are the disadvantages of using XML? As we saw, it requires a third party library, so whenever we distribute our application, we need to include at least one extra jar file. The XML files are uncompressed text files and could grow very large if we are saving large complex objects. Also, it is likely that the rendering of objects to and from XML is slower than serialization. Depending on our needs, either method might be the better fit. Now, let's write the test method to test saving and getting a serialized version of a My Library. Since this is very similar to saving and getting an XML file, we can start by copying the save to XML file test method. First, we'll open up the My Utilities test class for editing. We'll go to the save to XML file test method. We'll maximize here. Then we're going to copy the entire method, making sure to get the closing curly brace. Control C to copy. Then we're going to paste the method. And then we're going to change the method name from XML to serial. We're going to change the extension from XML to SER. Now we could have this extension be anything we want, but it'll be a lot clearer if we have an SER. It'll be clear it's serialized. Then we need to change the name of this method from XML to serial. And the same thing down here. And except for these changes, this method is the same as the one we copied from. And it's not surprising, it's doing the same thing. We create a test library object. We make sure that we didn't have an old file out there that might contaminate our test. Then we save the My Library object using our new method. Then we create a new My Library object 
again using our new method, and then we do the same tests to spot check and make sure it's got the content that we expect. Now, we'll create the method stubs, same way we've done before. We'll click here, Control-1 for Quick Fix, Create Method, creates the method. We'll save that, go back, do the same thing here, create the method, save, and then now our My Utilities test class compiles cleanly and we're ready to finish writing the methods. Now let's write the Save My Library to Serial File method. Here's the code. We'll start by changing the variable to ML, then we'll delete the auto-generated portion. First thing is boolean saved equals false. This will be our return value. Then we're going to do an outer try block and then it's file output stream FOS equals new file output stream and then the name the file name. We'll talk about this when we're done. Then we're going to go new and use code assist to create a new buffered output stream BOS and the input to that is the FOS. Then again we're going to use a new and we're going to create an object output stream called OOS and that has the argument from the line above. Then we're going to create our inner try block and we're going to use the write object method on the OOS that we created to write the ML object, the my library, and then we're going to set save to true because at this point the method succeeded. And then in our finally block, we're going to close the OOS, OOS.close. Then we're going to be careful here. We want to move outside the inner try block and catch, and we're just going to catch all exceptions, catch exception EX, and we're just going to do EX dot print stack trace like we did before. And then at the very end of the method, just before closing curly brace, we return our Boolean saved value. We'll move up so we can see it. Now the structure of this method is very similar to the save string to file method we wrote earlier. We nest an inner try block inside an outer try block. That way we can put the close method inside a finally block, but it's still inside this outer try block. Now let's look at the first three lines of the outer try block. The first line creates a file output stream. This class writes byte data to a file. Byte data, sometimes called binary data, includes printable and non-printable values. The Java serialized format is byte data, which is why it's not human readable. So we need to use file output stream to write it to a disk file. Now the buffered output stream does exactly the same thing as the buffered writer did. It buffers to improve performance. As we discussed earlier, the object output stream is what actually does the work of transforming the object into the serialized format. Now the only variable we need from these three lines is OOS. We use OOS down here to write and then we have to close the OOS object. We don't use FOS or BOS except to create the OOS variable. If we keep FOS and BOS floating around in the code, we could use one of them by mistake instead of using OOS. And in fact, we've done this up here. Where we used FOS here, we were really supposed to use BOS. Now the bad thing about this particular mistake is that the code would have tested correctly. It would just would have bypassed the buffered output stream. So we just wouldn't have taken advantage of the performance improvement from buffered output stream. So let's go ahead and fix this. We should be using the BOS there. 
Since these unneeded variables can cause errors, let's get rid of them. An easy way to do this is just to substitute for them one at a time. For example, here where we're using FOS, we could just say new file output stream file name, copy that and paste it in where we have FOS and then do the same thing where we have BOS. So we could cut and paste this ourselves, but it's quicker and safer to let Eclipse do it for us. Let's try it. We'll highlight the FOS, then we'll hit Refactor, Inline, it says we have one occurrence. Let's preview it. And here we see something that looks very similar to what we were looking at earlier in the tutorial where we see the before and after. So here's the original source where we have our two lines and then here is what Eclipse is going to do for us which is exactly what we would have done manually. So we'll press OK and now we've basically put the FOS variable inside the constructor for the BOS and then we can do the same thing. We'll click on BOS, refactor, inline, and if we were doing a lot of these we could use Alt-Shift-I as a shortcut key. And we'll just say OK. We don't need to preview that one. And now it's basically put those variables in line. So let's go ahead and clean this up so we can see it a little bit better. We'll save. So now we're only declaring the one variable that we're going to use down here. And it's very clear to someone looking at this code exactly what we're doing. We're just nesting the file output stream inside the buffered output stream and then that all goes inside the object output stream. Now let's look at the rest of the method. The oos.write object method is what actually does the work of converting the object into serialized format and writing it out to the disk file. Then we set our saved equals true because we know at this point we're successful. And then the close closes everything down, cleans it up. Now down here, notice we're catching exception instead of IO exception. And the reason for this is that these different methods throw a number of different exceptions. For example, if we hover here at object output and hit F2 to see the focus, we see that it throws three different exceptions. Then if we hover here, at the file output stream, it throws a couple of exceptions. And again, if we hover at the right object, we can see it throws some exceptions. So altogether, these methods throw six or seven different exceptions. Now, if we had different code we wanted to execute, depending on what kind of exception we were getting, we could put the different exceptions down here each in their own catch block and execute different code for each different kind of exception. In our case, since we're just doing the same thing, we're just printing out the print stack trace, regardless of what kind of exception we get, we can just use the exception class, which is the super class of all other exceptions. So whatever kind of exception we generate up here, this one catch block will catch it. And then at the end of the method we're returning our boolean value saved which will be true if we're successful and false otherwise. At this point we've got our save method written. In the next lesson we'll write our get method and then run the test. This is the end of lesson 11. I'm Mark Dexter saying so long for now.